I'm feeling good today, almost as if it were my lucky day, which is ironic because it's almost October 13th, a date which is sometimes linked with the origin of the Friday the 13th superstition. Some attribute the origins to the Code of Hammurabi, one of the world's oldest legal documents, which may or may not have superstitiously omitted the 13th rule from its list. Others claim that the ancient Sumerians who believed the number 12 to be a perfect number, might have considered that the one that followed it was decidedly non-perfect. In actuality, the ancient Mesopotamians associated the number 13 with the lunar cycle and therefore regarded it as sacred rather than unlucky. That said, at dawn on Friday 13, October 1307, King Philip IV ordered Jacques de Molay and scores of other French Templars to be simultaneously arrested. Founded around 1118 as a monastic military order devoted to the protection of pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land following the Christian capture of Jerusalem during the First Crusade, the Knights Templar quickly became one of the richest and most influential groups in the Middle Ages. By the turn of the 14th century, the Templars had established a system of castles, churches, and banks throughout Western Europe, and it was this astonishing wealth that would lead to their downfall. For the Templars, that end began in the early morning hours of Friday, October 13, 1307. A month earlier, secret documents had been sent by couriers throughout France. The papers included lurid details and whispers of black magic and scandalous sexual rituals. They were sent by King Philip IV of France, who had already launched attacks on the Lombards, a powerful banking group, and some claim that exterminating the Templars was his solution to his mounting debt problems. Jacques de Molay was the 23rd and the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar during the end of the Crusades and Philip IV of France was deeply in debt to the Templars, so he had Molay and over 600 other French Templars tortured into making confessions, which some people argue were false, as they were made under duress, which included starvation, sleep deprivation, and a device which yanked the victim's tethered arms behind him until he was raised from the ground and his shoulders dislocated. The men were charged with a wide array of offenses, including heresy, devil worship, and spitting on the cross, as well as homosexuality, fraud, and financial corruption. It's likely that some of these charges were to force the Pope's hand in helping to totally stamp out the Templars living in Catholic territory. The Templar lands and money were confiscated, and when Molay later retracted his confession, Philip had him burned in front of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris in March 1314. Within weeks of their confession, many Templars also recanted, but were also eventually burned at the stake. It has been said that Jacques de Molay cursed King Philip IV of France and his descendants from his execution pyre. King Philip and Pope Clement both died within a year of Molay's execution. Clement fell to a long illness on April 20, 1314, and Philip died due to a stroke while hunting. Some 400 years after the death of de Molay and the dissolution of the Knights Templar, the Fraternal Order of Freemasonry began to emerge in Northern Europe, claiming heritage from the mystique of the Templars to the builders of Solomon's Temple. Historian Malcolm Barber said in his book, The New Kingdom, 
Quote, it was during the 1760s that German Masons introduced a specific Templar connection, claiming that the order, through its occupation of the Temple of Solomon, had been the repository of secret wisdom and magical powers, which Molay had handed down to his successor before his execution, and of which the 18th century Freemasons were the direct heirs. Sacred mysteries are religious beliefs, rituals, or practices which are kept secret from the general public. It refers to esoteric knowledge which usually requires a formal initiation and a gradient of higher levels of belief before the concealed knowledge is revealed. Although the term mystery is not often used in anthropology, access by initiation or rite of passage to otherwise secret beliefs is an extremely common feature of indigenous religions all over the world, and this is especially so for occult secret societies. In his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, Manly P. Hall says, quote, Every pagan nation had, and has, not only its state religion, but another into which the philosophic elect alone have gained entrance. Many of these ancient cults vanished from the earth without revealing their secrets, but a few have survived the test of ages, and their mysterious symbols are still preserved. Much of the ritualism of Freemasonry is based on the trials to which the candidates were subjected by the ancient hierophants before the keys of wisdom were entrusted to them. Manly P. Hall, who was himself an honorary 33rd degree Mason, had a great reverence for the ancient esoteric knowledge that was passed down through the ages since remote antiquity, but also spoke to the way this occult knowledge was perverted, exploited, and used to control and enslave rather than liberate and uplift mankind. In another passage, he goes on to say, quote, Egypt, a great center of learning and the birthplace of many arts and sciences, furnished an ideal environment for the transcendental experimentation. Here, the black magicians of Atlantis continued to exercise their superhuman powers until they had completely undermined and corrupted the morals of the primitive mysteries. By establishing a priestly caste, they usurped the position formerly occupied by the initiates and seized the reins of spiritual government. Thus, black magic dictated the state religion and paralyzed the intellectual and spiritual activities of the individual by demanding his complete and unhesitating acquiescence in the dogma formulated by the priestcraft. The pharaoh became a puppet in the hands of the Scarlet Council, a committee of arch sorcerers elevated to power by the priesthood. These sorcerers then began the systematic destruction of all keys to the ancient wisdom, so that none might have access to the knowledge necessary to reach adeptship without first becoming one of their order. They mutilated the rituals of the mysteries while professing to preserve them, so that even though the neophyte passed through the degrees, he could not secure the knowledge to which he was entitled. Idolatry was introduced by encouraging the worship of the images which in the beginning the wise had erected solely as symbols for study and meditation. False interpretations were given to the emblems and figures of the mysteries and elaborate theologies were created to confuse the minds of their devotees. The masses deprived of their birthright of understanding and groveling in ignorance eventually became the abject slaves of the spiritual impostors. Superstition universally prevailed, and the black magicians completely dominated national affairs, with the result that humanity still suffers from the sophistries of the priestcrafts of Atlantis and Egypt. Bill Cooper was the author of a book published in 1991 called Behold a Pale Horse. And while I don't agree with all of his conclusions, which is okay, we don't all have to agree about everything, 
I had a lot of respect for him as I believe he spoke from a place of integrity, especially during his radio show in the 90s, which was just before the modern internet age, which addressed topics ranging from extraterrestrials, secret societies, and the Illuminati to what would currently be labeled as conspiracy theories. Bill claimed to have worked in naval intelligence, and while I don't know much else about his background, he was named a major fugitive by the United States Marshal Service in 2000, and on November 5, 2001, sheriff's deputies attempted to arrest him at his home and fatally shot him. I feel Cooper's contribution to the early UFO and conspiracy community was very unique and profound, and for that reason I'd like to share an episode from a broadcast he did on July 8, 1994. It's longer than the excerpts that I usually include, and I apologize to some of you for that, but it touches on a few points that mirror my own research that I will be elaborating on in future videos, so I decided to play it anyway. I hope you enjoy it, he covers a lot of ground, so pay attention, and post any questions that you have in the comment section, and I'll try to address them myself in a follow-up video. Now here's Bill. And with archaeologists getting ready to renew their explorations in Palestine and the Euphrates Valley, antiquarians expect further additions to the vast mass of evidence of the worldwide spread of primitive Freemasonry, which concealed, ladies and gentlemen, in its rites, symbols and ceremonies, the teaching and belief in the grand architect and great geometrician of the universe, a one and supreme God. But as I told you before, not, as many of you might believe, who have been initiated into the Lodge and the lower levels, not the God of the Bible. We can expect the explorations eventually to bring to light a lot of new material that will link the mound builders of the Mississippi Valley, the Mayas of the Yucatan, the ancient Egyptians, and the Chaldees, ladies and gentlemen, into one distinctly primitive brotherhood. And if you follow the thread, you will find that it leads right up to the present day. You see, the Illumined Ones believe that Freemasonry is the parent of all religion, the original worldwide cosmic Gnosis, diffused in ancient times to the uttermost ends of the earth, scattered, as it were. Freemasonry they believe is the Pompeii of prehistoric science. All of the Masonic ritual, its Egyptian signs, its Chaldean grips, its Sanskrit passwords, its ancient Hebrew symbols, its Kabbalistic allusions, and its historical records are supremely scientific in an ancient way and is a survival through long ages, ladies and gentlemen, by various underground channels of the knowledge of the universe which was gained by Sabian astronomers from the temple tops of Chaldea, India, and China, and recorded by the equally learned geometers and mathematicians of the ancient Orient. It was this knowledge concealed within the Brotherhood that enabled them to build the gigantic sundials, such as that at Stonehenge in England. The two pillars of masonry today are the same as those which stood before the Temple of Solomon, erected by the same building fraternity known as the Builders, under the supervision of the priest architects who built the Sun Temple at Tyre, before which similar pillars stood. They are the very same pillars as those that stood before the ancient temples in America when Cortez gazed in wonder on the civilization of the Aztecs and then set out to destroy them. They are the very same pillars that fixed the solstitial points in the first crude circles of stone with a central stone representing the sun and the same pillars which became the temple of Janus among the Romans the totem poles of modern savages, 
and the Jacquin and Boas of European cathedrals. You see, the key to the entire secret system is to be found in the ancient method preserved from ages long anterior to their reputed time by the Israelites of using identical characters for letters and numbers, a system called Gematria, which I've discussed before, notably in the series which we called the Mystery Schools or the Mystery Babylon series. Gematria. And upon this system, which a simple mathematical formula 10565 is shown to be the basic source of all manifested existence, that formula, when presented in the Hebrew letters corresponding to the numbers being Jod, Ha, Ve, Ha, or in English, J, H, V, H, R, Yahweh, R, Jehovah. Now, if this remarkable fact had been confined to the sacred writings of the Hebrews, it might be accepted as a peculiar outcropping of national genius. But this is not the case. Most of you just can't understand it when I tell you it's not the Jews. It's the brotherhood of which many Jews are a part. But so are many Episcopalians and many Catholics and many atheists and many agnostics are all a part. You see, my research has revealed the presence of an esoteric, esoteric means hidden, secret, or mystery, Jehovah worship throughout the entire ancient world is the basis of all of the outwardly pantheistic cults. Not the God of the Bible, but a pantheistic God. The real knowledge being concealed from the mass, or what they call the profane, by the priesthood and rulers, because they claim it was too high for them to grasp. But the truth is, this hidden knowledge was used to control them throughout the ages. The worship of the great first principle, defined and also hidden by the mathematical Jehovah glyph, and you don't know what I'm talking about yet, so don't form any premature conclusions, was at one time spread over the whole expanse of anciently civilized America, whether represented by the vanished race of mound builders of our own United States or the perished races of Mexico, Central and South America. And this latter wonderful fact may as readily be verified by the visitor to such a purely American collection as that in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington or the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, as by the digger in Euphrates mud or Egyptian sands. For the proof stands out once you understand the symbols. The crowning secret of the ancients, as well as of our own time, is that the study of the structural proportions of our universe as evinced in lines of force and direction, cyclic time periods, celestial areas and visible parts, reveals, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that it is of definite form, perfectly balanced proportion, and just such a synthesis of the principles of pure geometry as to show that the features exhibited are from the same causative source as that which geometrizes the snowflake, the crystal, and the flower blossom. Hence the expression used in Freemasonry of the grand architect and the great geometrician of the universe. The ancient Egyptians adopted as the key to this great cosmic philosophy the famous Pythagorean triangle of proportions 3 by 4 by 5. Proportions, which is the basis of the celebrated 47th proposition of Euclid. The understanding of this 47th proposition of Euclid is an absolute requirement of members of the Brotherhood. They called the three sides Osiris, Isis, and Horus. 
considering the first two as spirit and matter, and the latter as nature evolved from the wedding of the other two. In other words, the doctrine, the church, and the full body of initiates, the practice of it all. And this triangle, represented as the eye of Horus and typifying the sun, became the all-seeing eye of Freemasonry, and it is clearly visible on the reverse of the great seal of the United States of America on every single one dollar bill that you have in your wallets right this very moment. The value of the Hebrew letters in the famous triangle is 543 or 543, ladies and gentlemen, which is half of an oblong of three times four, the other half of which, also shown, is 345. The sum of both equals 888, and it is the value of the letters in the Greek New Testament name J-E-S-O-U-S-R, Jesus. An oblong of three by four contains three of four by nine and vice versa. I know this is a little difficult for some of you to understand, and you're going to have to do some study. For it took me years to understand it. The oblong of four by nine was represented symbolically as the Atef crown on the head of the Egyptian sun god Re, or Ra, whose name really means light. Light. And from this simple proportion alone, according to the methods of the ancient Egyptians, can be at once correctly delineated all the main physical features of our universe in absolutely correct astronomical proportions, and in so doing is evolved a sacred ancient symbol, the trapezoid, of ten, five, six, five proportions, which became known as JHVH among the Jews, Jehovah or Yahweh, IHOH in Phoenicia, IHUH in Chaldea, HUHI in Egypt, OIHAHU in India, Hohai and Fohai in China, that's H-O-H-I and F-O-H-I, and Iowa in ancient America, I-O-W-A, Iowa. We find this symbol, the Jehovah symbol, as the shoulders and arms of Osiris as he judges the soul's in Amenti, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and as the apron worn by the mysterious stone Colossi of Quirigua, Guatemala, copies of which are in our own American Museum of Natural History. Remember, this is an apron. It becomes a little more clear as we go along. We find the Masonic keystone to be not merely an architectural requisite, but the angle of exactly 23 and one-half degrees are the correct inclination of the axis of the earth to the pole of the ecliptic, and to embody the vertical section of the Great Pyramid of Giza four times repeated. We find the little clay idols of the departed aboriginal races of Colombia, South America, decorated with the geometrical glyphs of this secret order, the ornaments of the robes of the ancient Ica priests in Peru, but exemplifications of the same sacred figures, and the amulets of the Mayas and Toltecs in Mexico are also engraved with them that there must have been some worldwide organization to distribute these symbols in ancient and prehistoric times is evinced by the fact that by common consent the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Mexicans constructed pyramids which as shown by the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt and the Teocali of Chichen Itza, Yucatan as leading examples were component parts of a single geometrical problem the key to which 
is the simple Masonic apron as worn today and the graphic symbol of which covenant is still preserved as a cosmic figure among the Hopi Indians right here in the state of Arizona. In discussing the Masonic Keystone, Mr. Higgins displayed examples picked up in his travel from China, India, ancient Tyre, Egypt, and Palestine that were all cut on the same exact angle of 23 and one-half degrees. But perhaps his most precious specimens were several black serpentine amulets from Yucatan and Central America, more than 3,000 years old, that displayed the keystone and also the inverted Tau cross, so familiar to Masonic brothers in their lodge work. In pointing out the triangle of equal areas on the forehead of the amulet and the keystone nose, Mr. Higgins drew attention to the fact that the Jewish worshiper today describes with his fingers the triangle in the same place when making his invocation on the Day of Atonement. Another very rare specimen was an early Akkadian or Hittite seal expressing a triangle with three Masonic dots and the sacred proportions of three by four and four by five, a total of sixteen, meaning Yah, or J-A-H, which means the universe. Now, while these keystones are very valuable in proving the contention that Freemasonry was widespread even in prehistoric times, I consider the Masonic apron preeminent as the symbol of the hidden mysteries of masonry. It, too, is based upon the Pythagorean Triangle, which, as I said earlier, was used to conceal the mysteries of the Egyptian religion. The priests knew that the letters I, O, H, or J, V, H, which were publicly applied to the sides of the triangle and called Isis, Osiris, and Horus, were the secret mathematical formulae which they considered the key to the universe. Today you may see this miniature keystone hanging from necklaces of prominent Freemasons, sometimes prominent politicians, rampant in the New Age movement. If you will read a good book on mythology, the story of the death of Osiris slain by his brother Typhon, and the long search for his mutilated body by his disconsolate widow, Isis, you will eventually understand, especially if you have studied the mysteries, how the hope of humanity was fixed on the widow's son. Isis, of course, was the widow. Horus was the widow's son. Now, if Osiris was the doctrine, and the doctrine was murdered, killed, the church was left as the widow, widowed by the doctrine. The word was lost, the lost word of Freemasonry. Her son, the initiates, or the sons of the widow, were then, ladies and gentlemen, left without a doctrine. These were the full body of initiates. So the hope of humanity at that time was fixed upon the widow's son, the youthful spring sun god, H-U-R-A-M, or Huram, as his name was abbreviated, whose birth also constituted the resurrection of his father, Osiris, with whom he was identified. The development of the very famous Pythagorean Triangle also forms the triangle that is the base of the Masonic Tau Cross. The multiplication of the Pythagorean Triangle by four gives the base for the Magian's philosophy and develops the form of the Masonic apron just as worn today in the lodge room. It is the 64 square that I refer to in this square, the familiar checkerboard 
also has hidden within it the exact geometrical proportions of the Giza Pyramid. Many of you have a checkerboard in your home. Perhaps the most interesting Egyptian cut that I have is that showing Pharaoh invested with the triangular Masonic apron, holding in his right hand the grand Masonic emblem and the last grade attained, the Ankh Cross, in Masonic communication with one of that order whose head is covered with a mask representing the head of the god Thoth. Now, when you examine the old Egyptian documents or pictures of such, they reveal the fact that the apron is the badge of all the gods, kings, hierophants, and priests engaged in the rites of public worship and ruling of the masses. And the apron of the ordinary celebrant appears to be a triangle of white cloth suspended from the waist in front and pinned at the corners to the tunic at each side. In the case of the Grand Master, the apron is very elaborate in design. The figures you see represent the rising and setting sun in the lower corners and the sun at meridian. The rays of the sun are so directed as to describe a regular progression of geometrical angles, such as seen on a gnomon. And over the sun apron is worn the serpent apron. The modern Masonic apron, as worn in lodge and chapter, has descended intact in every exact particular from these ancient brethren of the square and compass. And many of you who call your researchers, call yourselves good researchers, have ridiculed me because I have made this connection over the centuries and the millennium. and have refuted your ignorantly conceived ideas that Freemasonry began in some lodge in England during the medieval times. The Brotherhood is as old as man. And it was this knowledge that was used to subdue the masses and make government work. We see thus indicated throughout the world, ladies and gentlemen, the Masonic Brotherhood known as the Illuminati, those who are illumined collectively, known as the Brotherhood, known as the Sons of Light, known as the Sons of the Widow, or the widow's sons, erected thousands of years prior to any civilization of which we have any present record to the same ever-living God whom we worship and reverence as the great architect of the universe. Today, around the world, in the lodges of all the brotherhoods by whatever name, by whatever occupation, it is the same. It is not the same God that we worship in the Bible, whether the followers of Muhammad, the Christians, the Jews, except some Jews who subscribe to the Kabbalistic teachings, they know the true meaning. Through the mists, ladies and gentlemen, of antiquity loom the history, the monuments, and the crumbling ruins of the vast Mesopotamian empires all so interrelated that historians find it hard at times to distinguish between legend and fact. But there are still intelligible, despite the beating of the winds and rains carved in stone or engraved on tablets, buried in the ruins of the temples, evidences that Freemasonic craftsmen met in lodges then, just as they do today. <laughs> 
if we were to attempt to trace Freemasonry back from generation to generation, lodge to lodge, for only a few hundred years, we would have a very difficult task. This is what many of you run into. And you don't know how to get over the wall. The mystery hedging about what they call the craft and the long periods of persecution and suppression make the difficulties nearly insurmountable until you learn to stop looking for names and lodges and follow the thread of their belief, teachings, and symbols. And if you're willing to credit Masonry's own legends of its past, which avere to it always have been a guild of sacred and symbolic architects, temple builders, and furnishers, then we leap back over the enormous periods of time which separate us from the earliest historical records of the human race. In our own day, we worship Almighty God under the abstract name of Jehovah, giving the latter no more technical significance than that of an ineffable name representative of the divine power and majesty simply because somebody told us that that's what we were supposed to do. Can't challenge what you're told? Can't challenge what you're presented with? My God, read your own Bible that you say can't be challenged and study the story of Job who challenged God himself and came out the victor. What is the matter with you people? You see, Freemasonry is what remains of the vast ancient science which derived countless expressions of this sacred word from the geometry of the universe and translated them into the ground plans, elevations, individual stones, symbolic designs, and sacred furniture of all the great temples of antiquity. One of the most curious discoveries of modern times is, contrary to the generally accepted idea that Jehovah has ever been the center of a pure monotheistic religion like that of Israel and unassociated with idolatry or craven images as reprobated by Jewish sacred law. Jehovah worship was originally the secret adoration of the hidden source of life conceived only by the illuminated priesthoods and their pupils because discoverable only through a science far above the heads of the sheeple are the profane, as the people in the mysteries call all of us before we learn to use our brains. So in almost all the ancient culture lands of the Orient, Jehovah reposed, veiled in a gorgeous external imagery symbolic of the forces of nature, and material features of our physical universe which was held out to the profane, that's you, in an elaborate pantheism. Pantheism. If we would fathom the remoteness of the origin of the devotion to a unique deity, we must take into consideration the vast number of evidences extending back into the Neolithic and Bronze Ages of primitive humanity for these stories, legends, existed long before any written Bible. When the pride of wealth and conquest among the great civilizations of the Near East, Chaldea, Babylonia, and Assyria were displayed in the palaces, towers, and temples abounding in the valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates, Jehovah was already older than the eternal hills and set forth in a thousand symbols which only the priesthood could interpret. The great human-headed, lion-bodied, bull-horned, and hoofed and eagle-winged monsters which stood at the temple gates were symbols of Jehovah and rebuses of his name. And the story of Ezekiel's vision is not a recounting of the landing of a flying saucer 
but is his own encounter within himself with this God, Jehovah. You can read the Bible a million times if you wish, and you can claim to understand it, and you can spout out your memorization of the verses and your interpretations of what it means all you want to. But until you have studied Demetria and you've studied the ancient history from which the Bible was written, you will never understand it, not in a million years, not ever. In the region of the Tigris and Euphrates, this region, which has produced almost all of the familiar Old Testament legends, the creation, the first fratricide, the deluge, the Tower of Babel, Samson, and dozens of other symbolic myths which have been found in the cuneiform scratched clay libraries of that distant land and day. There are many evidences that the original legend which crystallized into the worldwide Masonic epic, and yes, that's exactly what it is, had its first concrete expression on the banks of the Euphrates. And throughout that region are found the first evidences of the cultivation of masonry or the brotherhood in a purely symbolic or speculative sense in the existence of innumerable miniature stone amulets cut in the sacred geometrical dimensions, principal among them being the keystone discovered during the investigations of the ancient sepulchers of that region. And these little keystones, each of which is pierced for suspension, are made of the same stones as the famous Babylonian cylinder seals and are cut at a uniform angle of 23 and one-half degrees, that of the inclination of the axis of the earth to the pole of the ecliptic. How could they have known? You see, you look back upon these ancient people as some kind of stupid uh, cavemen with a club in one hand and a bladder of wine in the other. And it's not so, ladies and gentlemen. For they knew many things back then that we are just now beginning to rediscover. I say rediscover because they knew it, and it was lost over the centuries. There's a tradition in Freemasonry within the Brotherhood that the mythical King Nimrod of Babylon was protector or grand master of every trade guild, including that of the architects. But while the light of modern research has failed to locate the existence of that famed monarch, it is a fact that sitting statues of Babylonian governors have been found bearing architects' plans of temples or palaces that they had erected on their knees. One of Gudea, Patesi, or Viceroy of Eric, so posed, is now in the British Museum. And not only are innumerable Masonic symbolisms of our own day discoverable among the remains of these people, but remarkable sculptured scenes which will at once be recognized by anyone who studied the mysteries as correct representations of scenes of ancient initiation. And to those who have been through these initiations or who have studied them as I have, they are very familiar, strangely familiar. And the ridicule of the profane at the vaunted association of Freemasonry with the Tower of Babel was entirely uncalled for, because every bit of historical evidence brought to light among the ruins of Borsipa, the ancient capital of Babylonia, indicated to the Masonic antiquarian the coast relationship, association of the craft to that tower. And you will see... on the murals in the new Temple of Initiation, erected in Las Vegas, known as the Luxor, which means the source of light, depictions of the Tower of Babel and the ancient order, the Brotherhood, the builders associated with it, are all over the place. 
The Tower of Babel still exists as the ruins of the ancient Beers Nimrod at Borsippa. And you didn't even know it. This was the Tower Temple of Marduk, or Jupiter. And the king who abandoned this city to build a new capital and a more gorgeous temple to the sun god Baal at Bab Elu, the gate of God on the opposite or eastern bank of the Euphrates, was the great sage and lawgiver Hammurabi, the Amraphel of the Bible and reputed original author of the laws of Moses. The facts are these. One of the titles of the sun god Baal, which was widely adopted by eastern monarchs of a later period, was Salmanusar, or Savior King. This was literally King Solomon, which is also the meaning of the Babylonian royal name Shalmanusar. The king was the servant of his god and the executor of his mandate in erecting a temple to the Most High. The name of the architect given in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, who was sent to King Solomon by King Hiram of Tyre, one skillful to work in gold and silver, in copper, in iron, and in wood, in purple, in blue, and in fine linen, and in crimson, also to execute any manner of engraving and device, every kind of work of art which may be given him, was Churim are Hurum Abi, which is self-evidently a mere alliteration of the Babylonian name Chamurabi, or Hamurabi, or Hiram Abif. The fame of Hamurabi is just of the sort which would have made him the hero of countless legends for centuries to come, and indeed, that is exactly what has happened. You see, his name is a Kabbalistic one, connecting him with the Babylonian god Nebo, whose Hebrew name is Raphael, both meaning the planet Mercury, the closest satellite and constant companion of the sun, whom the ancients considered the executor of all the latter's mandates. Mercury's color, the blue of heaven, is that of the Masonic order. The best, the very best Babylonian representation of Hammurabi is on a stell in the British Museum containing a transcript of his code of laws and on which he is shown receiving them from the sun god Shamash, King Sal Am On the edge of whose robe is an angle of 66 and a half degrees or the inclination at which the Earth's axis crosses the plane of elliptic. To a Freemason, folks, there is much meaning in the statue of Hammurabi, the names of the materials in which the great artist who built King Solomon's temple was to work were not merely those of material colors or substances, but the symbols of the seven planets and four elements, Earth, Air, fire and water, which play an equally prominent part in the mythology of the ancient Babylonians, the symbolism of the Jewish tabernacle and temples, and that of modern mystery Babylon. Each of the planets, ladies and gentlemen, known to the ancients, which was at the same time a god, was represented by a metal and a specific color. The Chaldean temples were of seven stories, each smaller than the others as they rose. The lowermost chamber was that of Sheb, or Saturn, colored black. The next, that of Marduk, or Jupiter, colored orange. Next, there was a red stage for Nergal, or Mars. Then a middle chamber covered with plates of gold for the sun. Shamash, then the chamber of Ishtar, or Venus, a pale yellow. Then blue for Nebo or Mercury. And finally, silver for Sin, the moon, which was left unfinished or open at the top as an astronomical observatory. We preserve those colors and symbology 
on flags and emblems the world over. The Freemasons preserve the colors of the four elements in the veils of the royal arc chapter. The sun in its three phases of rising in the east, at meridian in the south, and setting in the west, became sol Om on Hence the ancient morning greeting of Salam, and the designation of the dying sun god who will rise again as Om on al or Emmanuel, and the Hebrews turned Salmanusar into Sar Shalom, or Prince of Peace, and played many other strange tricks with the old Kabbalistic lore of the Chaldeans, which is preserved by the Brotherhood even today. The Phoenician vessels no longer sail the Mediterranean Sea, and the secret of their famous Tyrian purple dye was lost and just recently rediscovered. But no traditional association of the ancient craft possesses more absorbing interest for the modern student of the mysteries than that which links the fame of ancient masonry to the venturesome seafarers whose winged argosies visited at least three quarters of the globe in the morning of the human record. This is indisputable. Freemasonry is not altogether oblivious of her debt to the brave Phoenician race, aside from the luster cast by particular characters of Phoenician origin in the infamy or fame to which they are due. Mr. Higgins says, The biblical association of Hiram, the great monarch of Tyre, Phoenicia's chief city, with his brother ruler of Israel, and the participation of the former in the construction of the wonderful Temple of Solomon, the story of which enters so prominently into the Judaic history, the Christian religion, the religion of Islam, and of the Brotherhood tradition, has been heard over and over and over and over again and is better told in Holy Writ than it ever could be recounted in modern terms. And that which particularly interests me is the question of what profane science and mere archaeology has to show of the presence among the Punic peoples of that same great cosmic cult which overspread the whole ancient world and which was based upon the geometry of the universe and the secret worship of Yahweh, or Jehovah. Now, if we examine the subject from a completely secular standpoint, without invoking the aid of sacred annals, we find an enormous fund of genuine evidence that the Phoenician branch of the Semitic race played the chief role in the distribution of the arts, sciences, architecture, symbolism, and religion from the ancient culture centers of India, Egypt, and Babylonia to the newer civilizations, which were scattered among the isles and along the shores of the Mediterranean, as well as to the western coast of Europe, and most probably, as the evidence tends to indicate, prehistoric America. The assumption that the Phoenicians were nothing but pagan idolaters can no more be sustained in the face of modern research than could be the notion of God, Deu, and Bogu being three different divinities, instead of English, French, and Russian for the same Almighty Creator. The people of ancient Tyre, Sidon, Aridus, Biblis, Beritus and other Phoenician localities spoke a language so closely applied to Hebrew that one must necessarily have been a dialect of the other. Early Phoenician and Hebrew alphabetical characters were practically the same, and all recorded lapses of the Israelites into idolatry were always into Phoenician idolatries, showing that basically these two peoples were but one and the same, differentiated in the maritime and agricultural branches of the Canaanitish stock. 
The Phoenicians may have had many gods, but to the priest, they were attributes of Jehovah, while the Hebrews had the distinction of a dogged adherence to the thought of a monotheistic deity all in all, Jehovah. Phoenician remains found over the whole expanse of the continent of the ancient world from Scandinavia to Ceylon prove that this clever people studied the arts and superstitions of their foreign customers and they manufactured for each the peculiar idols, amulets, and symbolic ornaments with the same commercial acumen which once sent cargoes of brass idols from Birmingham to India with every shipload of Bibles from Oxford. King Solomon's temple is shown by archaeology to have been a typical Phoenician edifice. Phoenician edifice, folks. A lot of people don't want you to know that, but that's exactly the truth. An adaptation which that race of clever architects made from the symbols the various nations had of the Jehovah cult. It must not be forgotten that what we today call Freemasonry was the religious science of the ancients, the state of the art of that day, right or wrong, made no difference. It was a symbolic reconstruction of the universe in all its parts, amidst which gorgeous furniture, imitating the host of heaven and the powers and properties of nature, splendidly robed priests and acolytes celebrated allegories of the great celestial cycles and the spiritual birth, life, and regeneration of man. The word man in Phoenician being ish. Ish. The symbology was always in the sun, spelled S-U-N. The greatest of all contemplations among the Phoenicians, said Mr. Higgins, who was one of the prominent experts, as evinced by their architectural remains, not only in their homeland at the eastern extremity of the Mediterranean Sea, but on the sites of the numerous Phoenician colonies, on the northern coasts of Africa, many of the Greek islands, and in France and Spain, was the so-called dual principle. The theory of the universe as a marvelous equilibrium between forces seeking to destroy and forces seeking to preserve it was the basis of all the Eastern religions symbolized in different countries in different ways. Today, you know it is the positive and the negative, the yin and the yang. The male and the female. The Mongols employed the yin and yin symbol. The Hindus, twin fishes. That's really what the twin fishes stand for, folks. The Egyptians, twin serpents and twin pillars. The Phoenicians copied the fishes, the serpents, and the pillars. But the greatest contribution they made to the Brotherhood was in the prominence they gave the pillars. You see, they used such pillars on the porch of their great temple at Melkarth, at Tyre, and copies thereof wherever Punic settlements were effected. The modern Mason can recognize these pillars in his lodge, and they were the two pillars flanking the entrance to the Temple of Solomon. They were not original, they were copied from the Phoenician temple in Tyre. The worship of Melkarth was something which has had most consequences in the distribution all over the world of peculiar rites and mysteries bearing upon the existence of what they call the divine spark in man and its survival of the grave. That's the principle that they use to convince their initiates that man is God. It is the Luciferian principle. Melkarth is said to have meant king of the city of Tyre and was identified by the Greeks with Hercules because like Hercules he was an incarnation of the solar principle of the sun and was afflicted in some peculiar manner by each of the twelve signs of the zodiac which lay in wait to slay him. Melkarth was also called Baal, the Lord, and Adonai, 
the Lord, which means exactly the same thing. The Adonai above was the spiritual prototype of the Adonai below, and the Phoenician mystery showed the blameless life, tragic death, and glorious resurrection of the being as an example to mankind. All of the Phoenician symbolism shows that wheat and grapes were the symbols of matter and spirit in this connection. Joseph's dream of the baker and butler was but a Phoenician allegory of the death of matter and survival of spirit. Good night. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful week, and I hope to see you again soon.